Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start off the afternoon um, session um, and our first presentation. I want to also apologize for not having been present in the morning and having missed so many great presentations. Um, I had to go to a meeting, uh, an important discussion of money funding applications, etc. that, yeah, I was called to, to go to. I would have loved to stay here, I have to say. Much more exciting here than there. Anyways, so I'm really pleased um, to introduce uh, Rosa Yanis Rosales. Um, she is a professor of anthropology at the Cook, which is a Centro Universitario de Ciencias Sociales y um, Humanidades at the University of Guadalajara. She is an, a multidisciplinary person, um, so she's not only an anthropologist, she's also a linguist, especially with regard to indigenous languages, Nahuatl, and um, a historian. So she has a wonderful combination of, of skills for the exciting research we are going to see. Um, and I, I have also already witnessed um, presenting her presenting at, on Tuesday. Um, I will just mention three publications that I have chosen uh, a bit, um, maybe coincidentally, but also just because they caught my interest. So um, her book uh, is uh, like she has a, a, a monography on, and I'm going to try and pronounce it correctly. Uh, I don't speak Nahuatl, so please excuse. Um, Ipan Altepet Montosa San Antonio de Padua Tlax. Tlaxomulco, en el pueblo que se llama San Antonio de Padua, Tlaxomulco, texto, textos en lengua nahuatl, siglos um, 17 y 18. Uh, and this one was published in 2013, so I don't know whether I have to translate for non-Spanish speakers. I think everyone in here understands the title more or less. Um, then um, an article that caught my attention as well is the Dios, Pecados, Demonios y Otros Vocalos en Dos confe conf Confesionarios en Lengua Nahuatl del Siglo XVII. Um, that was published in uh, Indiana, the um, review or um, journal, and um, in 2018. And um, there is also, and I, I mentioned that already when I, I introduced you on Tuesday, um, the, the chapter Nahuatl y Coca en Contacto, Documentos Coloniales del Sur del Obispado de Guadalajara. Um, and it appeared in a collected volume entitled Lenguas en Contacto en el México Colonial y Contemporáneo, Español y Lenguas Indígenas. And it appeared in 2018. And um, I think your homepage uh, at the University of Guadalajara does not really have your most recent publications, so there is more recent stuff out by her on uh, indigenous languages, indigenous knowledge. Um, I also, um, um, on Tuesday, I showed around uh, a volume with uh, chapters and works on uh, indigenous knowledge as a resource, so that is the field that you covered most recently. Um, and today you are going to present Writing, Reading and Paper in Mesoamerica. Okay, the floor is yours, Rosa. We're looking forward. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Leonora, Franz and Andreas for the opportunity of being here in Bielefeld and in this conference. Um, yeah. Um, yes, when I started... And I talked to to France about my possible participation. I um, I uh, wasn't sure it I could um, bring something that uh, I could talk about, and I still think I, um, as uh, Thomas said earlier this morning, I will be saying things that um, some other people have said, but. Um, there's there are some little things that I will uh, also say that I found out. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yeah. It, it has been said that um, reading and writing uh, were developed in um, in um, Sum Sumeria, I guess Sumeria, 
um, Egypt and China as like the three first places that they are known of, and then Mesoamerica. And um, um, at least that is what has been documented, right? So these are the topics I will uh, talk about today. Um, uh, it, it's the Sumerian system in Mes Mesopotamia. Um, okay. And then uh, the Mesoamerican system, which is the one I am going to talk about, it emerged approximately in the 700 before uh, Chris Christian era. And um, the earliest manifestation of writing occurred among the Zapotec groups, which is Oaxaca, um, south, um, many would say southeast of, of the country, of what now is uh, Mexico, right? And uh, where do we find uh, writing? Well, we find it in murals, in rock stella, in clay pots too, uh, in animal skins. Uh, there were two animals used for, for um, uh, writing, uh, which one, one of them was deer, and the other one was os, an ocelot. It's a type of... Uh, uh, f feline or f a type of cat or larger cat, <laughs> large cat, and paper. Uh, we also find it in uh, two uh, plants. One is amat; it's uh, a tree, and the other one is uh, maguey or agave, which is a type of plant where, well, there are about uh, between one hundred fifty and two hundred species of uh, agave it's one of them produces uh, tequila right so <laughs> we we can deal with that i think and um well um there are others that produce uh, mezcal which is another type of tequila not as famous as tequila but anyway so uh zapotec writing was uh, the first then the maya writing many people know about the mayas in, in, but it started in Guatemala, not in Yucatan or the Mexican states. Then Teotihuacan, this place where there are these huge uh, pyramids. And then mystic writing um, was the last one um, that we have, uh, that has been identified, right? But uh, Kulmas, Florian Kulmas says that there are like a dozen of systems um, in Mesoamerica. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, paper. Uh, well, paper was um, a very important support for writing, and it had other functions. Um, body ornament, uh, paper flags. Uh, um, it was um, uh, it was used to worship deities. Uh, to, to decorate deities. Um, um, it was used to decorate those who, we, who would be sacrificed, which is uh, kind of terrifying, but anyway, uh, to decorate uh, the walking stick of the dead, who would go to the Mictlan, which is the place where the dead uh, will go. And um, uh, it said that it was like a kind of passport, during the journey, and um, amatl, uh, one of the plants used for for um, producing paper, was also used for as a material for clothes. Um, it, this is because it was supposedly was easy to produce, right? Uh, yeah, and this is um, uh, a shirt, a men's shirt made of amatl. Um, so, um, yeah, this, uh, picture or this, this page of the book is a book by Hans Lenz. Um, it's written in Spanish, but I would think he was, um, uh, a person from Germany or Austria. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, um, agave or maguey is, uh, an endemic plant from Mexico. And um, 
It is obtained from the main ribs, which are, didn't bring a picture of, I don't know if you have seen it, but um, there, they are, there are many species and they can be, some of them are higher than a normal, the normal height of a person. So the, the ribs are cut and then they are put in water until they become fermented or rotten. And then, um, so it's, it softens and, uh, then they are carefully shredded. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the fibers are intertwined. Uh, this is information I had, I translated. So maybe my verbs are not the, the best, um, but it was uh, not knitted or spinned. Okay. Less as, um, a regular thread that you can sp spin it. On. And, um, and then it was polished. And so the, the, the surface is, uh, very smooth. That is a difference with a matte paper, which is still produced, but more as a handcraft. A matte paper, you can, well, of course, it's not exactly the same as in the codices, but, uh, the amate paper, always you can see like the, like the lines, uh, uh, because it is, uh, how you say it's stashed. Okay. And then, um, you can see like the, the, um, um how it's, uh, the crushing is, uh, remains. Okay. Now, ink and color production, that is, uh, very, very interesting because, uh, people in Mesoamerica used both organic um, materials and minerals, okay? Um, Nochestli is, uh, uh, is referred or is uh, the equivalent of red, okay? And it's ob obtained from a cactus plant. And um, uh, there is a, a worm that uh, works on it, let's say works and produces the, the um, uh, it's a type of liquid, type of, uh, kind of, uh, <coughs> and it was exported from New Spain, uh, from uh, very early, from the end of the 16th century. And many painters in Europe used it for their, for their, uh, paintings. Uh, but you could also get it from Tlawit, which is a mineral. Okay. It is obtained in caves and, um, uh, Diana Magaloni Kerpel, who is the author I'm following for this part, uh, she thinks that it was probably probably hem hematite or mm. cinnabar, but uh, well, she has the name in Nahuatl. And for getting green, kiltik, um, uh, green ref is the, like the the metaphor is the Ketali feathers, mm -hmm. um, and you get it from mixing. Um, two substances and putting them together and you get a kind, a type of glue. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. which is used, which is taken from orchids. I mean, I would think Mesoamerican or orchids and, uh, tea subtle is white. It's a mineral. Well, it's calcium sulfate and, um, it's found at the bottom of a lake. It's, uh, it was the lake of Tiscoco, which well, has a very different, uh, very difficult life. Okay. Okay. Now, what made it possible for writing to be developed? Well, uh, there is a series of conventions. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is Quetzalcoatl, one of the probably the most famous. Uh, God in Mesoamerica, and uh, for example, this is uh, the Bor Borgia Codex. It's believed to be the Nahua, but as you can see, uh, he, on some of his salient features are he has uh, a mask mm -hmm. as a bird because he's uh, he's um, he's an ally of the wind. Mm -hmm. So he needs to, to fly. Okay. And, um, he has his, his body is painted with 
uh, black ink because he's a priest, a type of priest. Um, this is um, supposed to be a Venus because he's also related to the planet Venus. Okay, so this this is a star. Okay. Um, okay, and this is the Borgia Codex. However, this is the this is Quetzalcoatl, um, the Vienna Codex. It is uh, in Vienna, and it's a, a different uh, group, a different language. And as you can see, he also he had the same characteristics, the same features, right? He also has this uh, mask of a, of a bird. Uh, his body is being painted uh, with um, black ink. Okay, and here he is carrying. These are stars, and you have to uh, uh, imagine like once you are on the in front of the. Uh, of the sea, where both the the sky and the water become one. Okay, this is uh, what Quetzalcoatl is doing. He's carrying the uh, foundational waters. Okay, this is what he's doing. So it's a uh, it's an incredible uh, painting, I think. Okay. Now, what other conventions do we find and that made it possible for, for a writing system to, to be developed? Well, um, as um, Valeria was talking about a while ago, um, uh, toponyms, um, the names of, of places. Uh, this is a um, colonial, it's, uh, it's in Tlaxcala, it's uh, the the Lienzo de Tlaxcala that uh, Richard was talking about yesterday. And um, you will see, in, as Valeria also uh, uh, showed us, um, the name of a town is in a little hill, or it could be a large hill. But, well, here it's, maybe it's not very visible, but it's, um, that's the name of the town. And, it, uh, of course, this is for the Spanish speakers because the Nahuatl speakers didn't need this uh, gloss, right? Yeah, this is a hill also. And it's, uh, it's the eye and uh, um, sand, and it, that's what it means in front of the, of the, like the source of sand, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and others, like all these are names of towns. So these are also conventions, right? That were understood by the mm -hmm. um, Mesoamerican peoples. Now, for what uh, was Mesoamerican writing system used for? Well, it was used for recording the history of their heroes, their leaders, the foundation of cities, uh, for recording their myths uh, and stories about their deities, for capturing the astronomical knowledge they developed, for example, counting and measuring time, which is not an easy task they they uh, developed, uh, and with it was very very precise the measuring of time, uh, recording taxes, of course. Um, they were read as a pr uh, memory primer, just as we are doing here, I guess. Um, they were read collectively. Codices were read collectively. Um, they were probably read like a standing up, and uh, because uh, some of them are books, as we have seen, um, uh, we can we can read them horizontally. But others, um, it is believed that they were put on the floor and uh, that. There was um, uh, Temashtiani or, um, or um, there's another person, I forgot, um, who would be explaining mm -hmm. to the students or to the people what the codex, what information was in the codex. Okay, um, it was colorful, as you have seen, artistic. 
um, and they were kept in Amoshkali, which is libraries, just as, as we understand libraries right now. And there were at least three libraries for sure that were recorded, Texcoco, Cholula, and Tenochtitlan, which are, Texcoco and Cholula are very, very close to, to Mexico City, about an hour and a half in, in a car, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, some of the characteristics of the low graphic uh, now with writing, well, um, is uh, according to Gordon Whitaker, um, uh, the Nahua people developed a system, a combined system of uh, of uh, hieroglyphics or glyphics and uh, logograms, just as uh, words, okay? And um, uh, for example, here we have the same um, glyph, okay, which is uh, Kiltik, um, and it is used for here, it's a place name for sac sacristy. Uh, there was no R in, in Nahuatl, so they found a way to, I, I guess they would say sacristy. Mm -hmm. And then this this person is named Cristobal, so I guess it was Cristobal. Uh, but it is, as you can see, it's the same glyph of a plant. It's a uh, kiltik, it's a plant. Mm -hmm. Now, after 1521, the year that uh, the Nochtitland was conquest, um, alphabetical ri uh, writing arrives in Mesoamerica. So uh, the church was very interested in in having in imposing Catholicism. So <coughs> they um, um, first the Franciscans and then the uh, Dominicans, Augustinians, and others started learning Nahuatl and other languages, of course. And um, for some time, both logographic and alphabetic systems uh, share the the writing space, right? Um, Amate and Agave are still used for some time, but European papers also start uh, mm -hmm. appearing in the in the let's say, in the arena. Yeah, another, a very important, um, well, two facts, uh, which are both very important. Um, in 1536, the Colegio, that has been mentioned already um, by Richard and I think by Sarah also, um, uh, was founded, right? And it was a school for teaching the liberal arts. That's what they used to to say to the sons of the ruling groups um, of the neighboring cities, okay, of Tenochtitlan. And then in 1539, uh, which makes a big difference with uh, Peru, uh, the first printing machines arrived. And I, I mean the first, I mean it, it, it's a big difference because if the conquest took place in 1521, only 18 years later, there were printing machines in Mexico City. But in Peru, they took about uh, 50 years. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first grammar of Quechua was printed in Spain, right? So, um, yeah, these two facts are very important for alphabetical system um, um, being developed in the in several of the languages. Yeah, uh, this is a colonial uh, codex, but here, well, uh, several things. Uh, for example, here we have what um, uh, Whitaker uh, calls um, part of the the glyphics uh, system. For example, this is metal, which is maguey. And this is a tusa, which is a, a type of a rodent, okay? And this is used, these two glyphs are used to indicate Mendoza, <laughs> the viceroy, the viceroy, okay? So, yeah, this is how it was, um, 
it was uh, signified or it was written. Okay, now uh, it is, um, although here we don't know, we don't see anything, but this is Tenamasli, which was, uh, who was a very important warrior mm -hmm. in the 1541s, that uh, so important that uh, the Viceroy Mendoza had to, in person, go to the western part of Mexico to fight uh, and to uh, how do you say, suppress the rebellion. Mm -hmm. And he is, his name means three stones. The three stones that are used for, for um, cooking, but so the fire won't touch directly, or maybe it will, I don't know, the pot, right? So it's called a tenamastli. That's a tenamastli. So he is standing on them, and he is uh, naked. He is, uh, and this is the the Rio Chiconahuapan, which is means nine uh, nine rivers that uh, we say that uh, have their waters uh, taken to to this river, a very important river. Well, now it's very polluted. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is um, it's. It's uh, incredible that uh, all the information that is here and the clause is not enough. Because here you say, um, okay, this is 10 um, houses, the year 10 houses. This is the, the glyph for house, Cali, and it's uh, 1541. This is the equivalent. And then here it says Pedro de Alvarado. Mm -hmm. uh, he is the author of the killing of the... Templo Mayor, very famous, and he's the conqueror. He was the conqueror of Guatemala. Um, Pedro de Alvarado, cuando murió, when he died, and this is Sol, Sun, and then well, we have we see a Dominican here, uh, which is not referred to in the gloss, um, and he's baptizing someone. We don't know if it's uh, Tenamasli because he was accused. Of that, although he had been baptized, he he decided to 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 have a a, a war against the Spaniards, and then it says este año de diez casas this year of ten houses, and of 1541, um, the Indians of Jalisco um, uh, um, started a war. Uh, um, those uh, who were subjected um, by uh, Antonio de Mendoza. Um, Don Pedro de Alvarado died, okay, when he was uh, running away. It says, cuando estaba retrayéndose. Mm -hmm. He was literally running away. Um, de los indios. Of the from the Indians, he was running away from the Indians. Um, he was uh, called uh, the Indians called him Donatio, which means the sun, um, because he was <coughs> apparently he was blonde. Okay, so this is already a colonial. Um, a colonial codex, and uh, and we can see that they are sharing the space. Both writing systems, they are they are sharing the space, and they are both used. Yeah, this is another uh, colonial uh, codex, and uh, and it's about uh, it's Coscatzin, uh, and it's uh, from Tlatelolco, mm. and um, and it has to do with the descendants of Cuauhtémoc. Um, the last uh, ruler of Tenochtitlan, and um, and um, well, again, they are sharing the uh, alphabetical writing is sharing the space with uh, um, Mesoamerican writing. Now, writing in New Spain or colonial Mesoamerica, and a known number of codices were burnt. At least uh, two uh, places are registered, one in Mani, uh, Yucatan, 
and the other one in Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. Supposedly there is a, well, well, what James Lockhart has found is that there was more or less a transitional period of 100 years, mm -hmm. more or less, when the, um, the work of Amatlacuilus, um, which are the codex writers or painters, and the Escribanos, the scribes or notaries, coexisted. But uh, slowly, of course, agave paper disappeared. Amate paper survived as a handcraft. And European paper, paper was used in most paperwork and also for printing books, of course. And um, uh, it substituted uh, uh, local paper and animal skins. Now... What else? Texts became colorless. Mesoamerican genres of texts disappeared. New genres were produced by indigenous scribes. One that could be considered close to, to a Mesoamerican genre is the titulos primordiales, which are like these stories um, uh, that are presented by the rulers of a town and they pre are presented to the to the viceroy, to the audiencia, or sometimes to the king um, to argue that they have been, that the, the, the group of people or, uh, well, a group has mm -hmm. been there since um, before memory was invented, right? More or less. Um, but also colonial writing was used to denunciate, mm. to, to, to write mm. wills so that their property, property would not go to hands, uh, to different hands. Yeah. And um, logograms are going to disappear. As you can see, this little figure over here, this is all in now. Okay. Mm. And uh, this little figure over here in the page is like two or two and a half centimeters mm. a square. Um, so, and this is also something, but I don't, I can't, um, I haven't been able to, to decode what it is. Okay. So little by little, this is from uh, 1572, more or less. So uh, logograms are going to disappear. Uh, now, what is the work of indigenous scribes or notaries? Yeah, those who are writing in their language. So, well, I think um, from working in the western part of Mexico that the uh, early scribes were trained at the Colegio de Tlatelolco and in other monasteries. And then they departed to other regions. I mean, the Colegio de Tlatelolco is in Mexico City. They departed to other regions um, accompanying friars, and they served as interpreters, as doctrineros, but that was the word, to, sh to teach the doc doctrine, doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, um, and either they worked as the scribes in mm -hmm. brethren, mm -hmm. in the confraternities, or as choir singers. They, for all these uh, professions, they had to know how to read and write. Mm -hmm. um, and they stayed where they worked. They trained local people. Um, and these local scribes uh, made their, the system their own, their writing system their own. And they used it for whatever reason, the Altepet or, the, or town, the brethren or an individual um, needed, needed it for, yeah. They were mostly men. Um, as I mentioned the other day, um, I have found some, some texts that are very much likely written by women. Okay, but um, um, they were written, um, most scribes were men. And they wrote um, use, uh, uh, using their variety of, of Nahuatl or of their uh, whatever language. Um, uh, this I have found in, again, in the western part of Mexico, 
um, the texts produced in the 16th century are written in a very central Nahuatl, mm -hmm. but then the local Nahuatl, the Western Nahuatl, starts uh, being um, recorded. Okay, um, yeah, I think that it was transmitted within one family, uh, like the leaders of a dancing group. It's uh, very much uh, the profession of one family. It's mm -hmm. it's transmitted from parents to 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 their children, and um, um, it was it served um, writing denunciations, um, trespassing uh, power, like uh, to another person to be represented. To, re to be representative of a town or of another person, uh, measuring uh, land. Um, so, what were the social functions of reading and writing in Mesoamerica? <clears throat> well, I think it must be understood as a social uh, practice, okay? Uh, both before the pre -Hispan in the pre-Hispanic pre period, and in the colonial period. But of course, there were changes. Um, probably we don't know enough yet uh, of what it meant, that this change, okay? Um, but I think that it meant collective education. Um, unfortunately, we don't know very much from, for, as how they were read. I mean, there are scarce uh, mentions, okay, but not very much as how they were used, how they were thought. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes we infer. Um, and then the writing of legal documents, I think it also has a social function. But, um, well, a group of people could, in some cases, um, make a successful uh, denunciation, have uh, some paperwork um, be placed in the right place, in the right hands, at the right moment, okay? So, um, but other times the, the, the paper was stored in an archive and was forgotten. Uh, it was not a collective practice, I am, I, mm. we, we, we can see that, okay? Um, what well, has changed um, in Mesoamerica? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> As a hypothesis, um, uh, what is a writing system? Well, it's uh, a system for encoding and decoding information, and um, it must be um, there must be someone who writes for someone who can read it, who can decode it. And if we start with the Zapotecans, the Mayans, the Teotihuacans, and the mystics, um, uh, it must have served a, a common need. Mm -hmm. um, which one? <laughs> um, probably it was administrative, commercial, scientific, religious, or other. Um, the important thing is that we can see um, that there is a set of conventions that are uh, followed uh, regardless of what whatever language was spoken, mm -hmm. right? And um, um, I would think it seems like there was this big reunion where they decided, okay, how are we going to talk about Quetzalcoatl? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, he is uh, related to wind. Okay, he has to have um, a mask as a bird. He has to have um, a star because he's related to Venus. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is a hypothesis that I mm -hmm. cannot prove. Okay, um, but uh, for example, um, when I was uh, doing uh, when I was doing the the research for this paper, I found out I didn't know that, uh, for example. Um, when you see babies uh, in a codex, you know that they are babies because they are wrapped, right? But if you see uh, 
a baby who is with his or her little feet out, it's a toddler. So uh, we can have an idea of the age of the of the of the baby, right? Uh, young women uh, have their hair uh, pre uh, arranged in some way, whereas married women have it in another. Old men and old women are different from from young men. So there's there's all this whole set of conventions that are following. Okay, uh, within Mesoamerica. Um, now, if we compare it to the other systems of the world, okay, um, at least from what I found, I didn't, of course, I'm not a specialist in neither system. Um, in Mesoamerica, it is several groups mm -hmm. speaking. It's uh, different languages from different families, uh, from different linguistic families, who developed this writing system. Uh, of course, I don't, there must have been several varieties of uh, of the other languages, but I don't know if there there were several <coughs> languages. Okay, um, and then when the conquest uh, took place. Um, of course, it was not only the substitution of a writing and reading system for another, uh, or using a different support for for what was uh, written, uh, but different functions. Uh, uh, it was the that the writing system um, achieved. Okay, uh, different from the pre-Hispanic era. Uh, uh, era. So I think um, this also uh, this also worked um, as part of the detachment that people um, uh, felt have felt um, towards their language, and it has helped um, to be very very um, um, careless uh, of. Main, Mexican main society saying, no, 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 but you didn't know how to read and write and you mm -hmm. didn't have a writing system and the, because that you can hear uh, very often. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I think I have finished. I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>